Welcome to Thinking Like a Lawyer, with your hosts, Ellie Mistal and Joe Patrice, talking about legal news and pop culture, all while thinking like a lawyer, here on Legal Talk Network. Welcome to the first annual Thinking Like a Lawyer's End of the Year Awards Gala. We're Together here, I'm Joe Patrice from Above the Law. My colleague, Ellie Mistal, we're both in our tuxes for this grand event. I'm still alive. I'm still alive. Yes. Can you feel the excitement in the air tonight? Like the the red carpet filled with so many embarrassing lawyers that we're going to talk about. It's just, it's my favorite event of the year. 2016 is a year that needs to die. Well, right. Okay, so you're not paying attention to anything that's actually happening in this podcast. You're just kind of like ranting on your own, which actually makes some sense. So we'll go to the I'm in a tux. I mean, what do you want? What yeah. do you want from me? You think, Fair enough. think I'm happy? Yeah. So let's begin as we usually do with Ellie complaining about something before we get into the, the sweet, sweet awards gala. So my 2016 ended with me getting death threats from the Breitbart crowd, which, all right. So here's what my actual thing that's pissing me off, right? Besides, you know, the fear and the anxiety of of people threatening to hang you from a tree. It's that if you think about it legally, there's not a lot that I can do legally to protect myself or my family when this happens, right? Like you need a the kinds of threats that I were getting over email and Facebook and Facebook Messenger and Twitter and Instagram, they're not the kind of specificity that the law requires. Having been through this actually once before in 2014, I know a little bit about like what you need to have in order to go to the cops or go to the FBI um, to protect yourself. And you know the the difference is that you know if if I go to the cops and I say like all these people are threatening to lynch me, they're like, whatever, bro. Maybe you shouldn't be on Facebook so much. Um, I have to be able to go to cops and say. Peter is threatening to lynch me. And he made that threat, you know, in some kind of specific, like, I am going to come to your house at X time and go to your ginkgo tree and string you up from that. Like, if I have that, then I can go to the cops, then I can get some protection. But anything less than that, and it's like, it's my fault for daring to be a black man who spoke on Facebook or Twitter. Okay. Yeah, that doesn't that doesn't piss you off, or you're just cool with that. I mean, I I don't know. I went to law school. I understand that threats have to be specific in order to involve law enforcement in them. Like that's true. It is unfortunate, but that's you know, that is in fact the way the law works. It is unfortunate, but I mean, if you wanted to give the cops way more money so they can chase down everything, I mean, I think that if that strikes me as though that could be dangerous. I mean, look, given what I write about the cops would be the last people I would go to anyway. Right. right. So <laughs> here you the, are. They'd be the least likely people to protect me. Right. So at that point, what was the point of the gear grind? I wanted to go to the FBI. Uh, yeah. Well, I mean, I guess I'm not altogether sure. I mean, having interfaced with the FBI a lot through my time as a white collar lawyer, I, I'm not so confident in the, let's put it this way. There, there are far fewer Mulder and Scullies than there are, uh, rank and file folks but you know sure put your faith in them i gotta put my faith somewhere all right let's get to some awards so let's get to the actual thing that we're talking about yeah so we we're doing our end of the year extravaganza where we're we've decided to offer some awards uh in the thinking like a lawyer fashion to the various people who made this year oh oh such a great year for uh making fun of things not such a great year for everything else but a great year for making fun of stuff so Without further ado, where should we begin? Well, there was a point during this year where I thought that the person who should win this next category was going to be the biggest story of the year. Um, so let's start with non-judge of the year. Drum roll, the non-judge of the year. This year's non-judges, the nominees, Angela Stokes, that is the Cleveland area judge who, because of a series of ethical allegations against them had to leave their job and now currently works at a Chick-fil-A in the area. Uh, Rhonda Yum. Crawford. Yeah. Rhonda Crawford, who is the law clerk who 
her judge allowed her to just put on her robe and resolve cases for her, even though she wasn't actually a judge. Now it's come out that her judge might have had uh, might be suffering from Alzheimer's. I uh, yeah I I and as soon as I heard this story, I thought that was quite possibly what it was. And the final nominee for non judge of the year, Merrick Garland. Because obviously. How in the hell did this happen? I remember sitting here at this very desk, February 2016. The news comes in on a Saturday that Scalia has passed away. And my wife has gotten, like, we have two small children. My wife is taking a nap on a Saturday. And I go and I wake her up and she literally says, there better be a fire or Obama better be dead for you to be waking me up. And I say, pretty close. (laughs) Wait, why was she being woken up? It was in the late afternoon. She was taking a nap, dude. Oh, okay. Two kids. Naps yeah. are hard to come by. Fair so I enough. wake her up. I wake her up, and Scalia's dead. And for you know a good two or three weeks, liberals thought that things were going to get better in this goddamn country. Not how it turned out, was it? Okay. And so who wins the non-judge of the year? I don't know. What are you thinking? Oh, that wasn't my description of the nominee. That was my vote for the winner. Oh, Merrick Garland, obviously, is the non-judge of the year. Interesting. I mean, I, I could see that. I don't know. Working at a Chick-fil-A, man, that's that's bold. But I will consent to this one. I think that you, you make an, an, a compelling case, Merrick Garland, for his non-completion of his duties as a judge for the entire year, not necessarily by his choice. Nice. So there, we have our first winner. Next up, uh, let's get this rolling with some uh, some classic ATL logic. Uh, let's go with the Practice Pointers of the Year Award. This is a trophy that we give annually to the lawyer who best shows innovative practice points in performing the duties of the profession. Uh, this year's nominees, very, very esteemed group. We begin with Jessica Michali, who is a lawyer who allegedly uh no um just a well sort of like she's she was defending an indigent client i should say a lawyer in florida who was caught and this is the quote of the guard who caught her uh she denies these allegations but caught according to the guards report quote bent over a table apparently having sex with an inmate boom it certainly an unorthodox interview style, to say the least, but it's something we learned this year. Secondly, we have Bradley Schaefer. This is a lawyer who was involved in a case about unpaid wages for strippers. His dog died, which made him very upset, and led to him writing a brief that includes the following line, quote, if you all do not resolve this at mediation, dot, 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 I'm going to literally, all caps, fuck them so far up their asses with the IRS that my dick is going to come out their noses. That line, by the way, was then accompanied by a footnote. He actually footnoted this. Felt like there was a need for a citation after this line. <laughs> and finally, uh, Chad Flores, who was a I'm not familiar lawyer with Chad. What, opened, did, what did Chad do this year? Chad opened up his Fifth Circuit brief with a hypothetical conversation between him and his client that kind of went roughly along the lines of, client, why did we lose this case? Lawyer, well, sometimes judges do the wrong thing, but thankfully the Fifth Circuit is smart and will figure this out, yada, yada, yada. The judges responded to this with their own hypothetical conversation where all three of them agreed that this was stupid. (laughs) Well, I'm going to give Chad a pass then because it seems like you tried some performance art in a brief you know, sometimes those things stick and sometimes they don't. But I'm going to give him I'm going to give him a pass for trying to be creative. You know, I don't feel I, I don't want to award Jessica because it feels slightly, you know, it feels slightly sexist to be all up in her business, you know, with her clients and interview. I agree. And it's also important to note that, you know, she denies these allegations. So it's not nearly as cut and dry. Exactly. Um, we don't know what the corrections officer actually saw, so so I don't want to totally burn her up. Schaefer, I yeah, mean, he's, th- he's talking about dick noses. Like that's, that's yeah, a problem. I, I think that's that's our obvious winner. Congratulations, 
to Bradley Schaefer on winning the Practice Pointer of the Year award. We're just uh, yeah, we're having a good time here. We, I thought about, and I didn't actually end up doing this because I didn't have time. I thought about maybe for next year's uh, awards gala, we got to do this right, like any real awards show, and have an in memoriam with some sad music <laughs> in the middle. Uh, I didn't go have time to go through and do all that, but uh, yeah, well, something I, to look forward to for next year. I'll pull out my tenor saxophone. Um, let's finish our insertion categories. Okay. All right. So. This is the award named after us. This is the Thinking Like a Lawyer trophy for outstandingly inappropriate insertion of the law into non-legal settings. All right. I know who I think should win, so you, All right. you read the nominees. I know I got my winner. Okay. The first nominee uh, is an unnamed couple, so we're just going to call them unnamed douches. These are a lawyer couple who wrote a long, long, incredibly detailed and quasi-threatening letter to their daughter's teacher, chastising the teacher for scolding their daughter. As one would imagine, it involves invoking the fact that they are, in fact, lawyers multiple times. It's classic. Secondly, we have Dwayne Downing, who, a Texas lawyer who wrote a, speaking of threatening demands, he wrote a demand letter to a restaurant for not giving him $2.25 worth of soup. And finally, Terry Crouppen, who paid the big bucks in St. Louis to take out a Super Bowl ad to air during, locally during the Super Bowl to trash the Rams for moving to L.A. That's thinking like a lawyer, using your legal skills for useless stuff. Now, obviously, I think parents uh, chastising their, uh, their school teacher is, is ridiculous, and, and, and that's, that, that, that's just not even funny. That's just why America fails. Um. I'm going to defend Dwayne Downing for a second here because I, too, have been in a New England clam chowder shop, ordered a bowl of clam chowder, got a cup of clam chowder, was charged for a bowl of clam chowder, and felt like justice had not been served and, and was forced to have quite a long conversation with the waitress about this injustice. So I think the clear winner is Terry Crouppen, who went all out over a crappy football team moving away from a crappy city back to the city where they deserve to have a football team. Well, all right. I, I'm, I'm agreeing with your final ending. I also uh, defend Dwayne Downing. I actually wrote an article. At, I covered this at the time, and I defended Downing when everyone else in the world was jumping down his throat. I'm like, you know. Hey, you put out a menu. It says you can get this soup. You don't give it to him. It's not like he actually sued them. He just sent a letter asserting his rights. And, you know, good for him. And good not only for him, but for all the other customers who might come in looking for a deal on that day and get the shaft. So I, I defended him. He was standing up for the little person. I'm with you on Terry Krupp, and I don't necessarily think that L.A. deserves a team because there's a reason they've run every team that's ever been there out of town. But... You know, come on, dude. You don't think you don't... the largest media market in the country deserves a football team? I mean, to the extent to the extent that we can use the word dessert and football team in the same sentence, which I agree is is a stretch, but to the extent that we're going to use that in the same sentence, how does Los Angeles not deserve a football team? I mean, scoreboard. It's just they've had, over the course of the years— They've had three football franchises, and they have run every single one of them out of town. Now they've gotten one of them back, and they will inevitably not care about them either. Look, you and I are on the same page about how awful stadium deals are for cities. And yes. to me, the best thing about L.A. having a football team is that now not every football team can use L.A. as the – hot ex-girlfriend to hold their cities hostage. That's fair. Like, That's fair. LA needs to be off the table for the sh charade that NFL team owners run. So that's my big reason for LA deserving a team. That is a much better argument in my mind. And I can, I can get on board with that. All right. Well, let's go to, Do we have an award here that's called the golden anal beads trophy. 
We sure do. In honor of the classic story of a, I believe, Drexel Law professor a few years ago sending around to all of her students a what she thought was an attachment for some assignment, but was in fact her internet search for anal beads. So we're calling the Dignified Professor of the Year Award the Golden Anal Beads Trophy. This year, we have four nominees. Well, three nominees. There's a, uh, you know, there's co-producers and stuff. So first up, we have Stephen Winter, who teaches in Michigan, and he wrote an email to all of his students blaming them for skipping his con law class to finish their legal writing papers and made a string of ridiculously overblown statements about how con law is the most important thing to know for the bar exam and how 30% of the Michigan bar exam is about standing, which seems like they... Untrue. It's either untrue or Michigan has a really poorly balanced bar exam. Next up, we have Randy Barnett and Nick Rosencrantz, the conservative-leaning Georgetown law professors who turned into whining babies demanding a safe space when everyone started making fun of them for being, for, you know, for trying to honor Scalia after he died. Oh, somebody thinks that he may not have been the best thing ever. <laughs> Wah, cry about it. And finally, Nancy Schertz, the Oregon law professor who was just disciplined yesterday, I think, or yesterday or the day before, over her incident, which was going to a Halloween party in blackface. To make a statement, though. Oh, yes, yes, to, to make a reference to a book that she read, I guess. Right. Uh, yeah. Black Doctor in a White Coat is the book or something like that? Yes. So she went as she put herself in blackface and a white coat, which kind of went over the heads of everybody, at the very least. Yes, one would imagine. Who's your pick here? I think they're all jerks. <laughs> I mean, I... I don't want to go after winter. I think that I, I understand the frustration of people skipping your class, especially to skip it to work on a project that is generally not graded. So I think that I, I kind of side with him, even though he he may have gotten a little out of hand with the things he said. This is a tough one between the other two, though, because because Nancy obviously is the most ridiculous and offensive act of a professor this year. But she's a lower profile professor than, say, Barnett and Rosencrantz, yep. who spend so much of their effort whining and complaining about how college kids these days and their safe spaces and wusses. And then as soon as the tables were turned, they revealed themselves to be bigger babies than all of them. So I think I'm going with them. The hypocrisy of Barnett and Rosencrantz, I think, has yeah. to win the day. Okay, good. Uh, we're on the same page. So we're on the same page, but so we kind of agree on number one, but we diverge on number two because in a normal year, I would pick winter because I have Ooh. a real thing over professors who get pissy when kids don't want to go to their class. Like uh, maybe it's because I write on the internet, maybe because I know that part of my job is to compete with the professor for the eyeballs of the students in their class. <laughs> but, you Fair. know, be more interesting. Like, like if you were a more interesting professor, kids would not skip your class. Period. End of story. If kids are skipping your class, it's because you're not very interesting or they don't think your class is very important, which is on you as the professor to school them otherwise. Interesting. Yeah, I mean, that's a compelling argument. But yeah, I think the hypocrisy, the Barnett and Rosencrantz win the day. All right. So, and the beads go to. Barnett and Rosencrantz. This is their first win, their first <laughs> nomination. That's going to be the best part about doing this on an annual basis is when people get repeats, if we could have that little voiceover, this is their <laughs> second nomination. All uh, right. So let's go to what I like to call the professionalism award. This is just <sighs> a general award for professional behavior for just, you know, not even – Making fun of folks so much as some of these have been more sarcastic. This is a, some of these are like real heroes to us. So, number one, I have an unnamed associate. We didn't uh, divulge the uh, identity of this one, but unnamed associate who wrote in their departure memo to their partner who had asked them to follow up on a few things on their last day do them your fucking self. A proud moment in uh, Johnny Paycheck lore. We also have an unnamed summer associate who, at a summer event, slapped an associate, according to reports. Just hauled off and smacked an associate. 
Not because the associate did anything inappropriate. It wasn't that kind of a story. It was just like, bam. So there we go. Random acts of violence. Law firms need more of that. We have Duncan Lloyd. Uh, this is uh, someone you are very familiar with recently. Duncan Lloyd is a city attorney in Philadelphia, and he scrawled fuck Trump graffiti on the sides of a fresh grocer, which is like the Philadelphia equivalent for a Whole Foods, and got in a bit of hot water for his uh, sad display of protest. Yeah, and what was he wearing while he did this protest? He was wearing a blazer and an ascot and holding a glass of wine while he he didn't spray the graffiti. He filmed his friend spraying the graffiti so he could have his other hand. So he had one hand on his camera phone, the other hand on his glass of wine, wearing his blazer and ascot while the crime went down. Amazing. I didn't know that ascots were a thing people wore outside of Hanna-Barbera cartoons, but here we are. Uh, and finally, we have a fourth nominee in this category, which is Judge Bryant Durham, who is the judge in the famous Denver Allen transcript, which made a lot of news throughout the year. It eventually got turned into a Rick and Morty adaptation where the judge and the defendant on trial started screaming at each other. And it 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 got real. We will put up the... Uh, video of this uh of this event when we post this so that people can see it so i have to say this about the duncan lloyd story just just in point of fact i've been writing for atl for eight years i've written some great stories duncan lloyd is my most traffic story ever by a <laughs> long way and that was just a sad guy in an ascot scrawling graffiti so it's kind of has to be my winner um, but I am biased. I hear you. Uh, I certainly like him. I I really do. It is hard to get over that uh, Denver Allen transcript, though. That was that was just the height of professionalism for me. Was that back and forth where the judge eventually started demanding that Denver Allen masturbate in the courtroom in front of him? You know, things like that. I thought I thought that was that was really the height of professionalism. I can't disagree with you, but I I gotta go with my boy. He's dancing with uh, the date that brung you. Mm, all right. So we have well, disagreement here. The Denver Allen transcript is going to become every every award show needs at least one horrible crime, you know, but somebody who got robbed. Let's go ahead and we will give this award to Duncan Lloyd. And everyone can complain for years about how Bryant Durham is like the E.T. of this awards show. I agree. I was going to call him the, the, the Pulp Fiction, whereas Duncan Lloyd is definitely in the Forrest Gump. Uh, he absolutely year. is. Oh, <laughs> uh, wow. I mean, it's been an amazing night just seeing all the celebrities out in the crowds. Our know. evening is coming to an end. Ricky Gervais is. is already drunk. Yeah. I mean, he started the night drunk, but uh, <laughs> he was going to fill in for you until uh, until uh, he got a little tipsy. So we end with the what we like to call the big award. This is uh, our version of Best Picture. This is the... Dewey LaBeouf Memorial Law Firm of the Year Award. So, read it, soak yeah. that in. All right. The Law Firm of the Year. Our nominees are, I'll do these in a different order than I have them written here, uh, Harder, Morell and Abrams. You may remember them for their efforts in helping Peter Thiel buy free speech away from the people who had it. <laughs> Which uh, used to be us. Yeah, the uh, the Hulk Hogan lawyers. Jones Day, the venerable law firm who is making America great again as pretty much their entire arsenal of lawyers has been working overtime to help out Donald Trump and are now forming large swaths of his legal team in his cabinet. And finally, Cravath, the perennial champion of law firms, Cravath, for raising everyone's salary in the middle of the year and trying to force a bunch of dumb mid-tier firms out of business for following them. In a normal year, Cravath wins this walking away, right? I ugh, I think they still might. They hadn't had a salary raise since 2007. Cravath did it. Everybody else followed. Cravath has now set us up for the next great lawyer recession, which will be great for ATL's traffic. In a normal year, Cravath wins walking away. But Jones Day has turned itself into the legal shock troops for a fascist administration. I don't know how you can beat that. I don't know who has a more 
ATL law firm of the year year than Jones Day becoming completely co-opted by a fascist regime. That's amazing. Oh, I don't see any of that. No, I'm absolutely doubling down on Cravath. They Cravath actually is the most ATL of the of the years. It's it changed the economics of the entire industry. It finally gave associates money that what are ATL's basic watchwords? There's the embarrassing stories like the practice pointers stories that we had. There's paying associates and there's messing with mid-tier and less prestigious firms. Those are like the three pillars of our organization. And two of them are fulfilled by Cravath here. I think this is a no-brainer. Let's look at this from a kind of an MVP analysis, right? If you take the guy off the team, what happens, right? If Cravath doesn't raise salaries... Then no one does. Don't you think Sullivan and Cromwell does? Don't you think that no. eventually SNC gets there? No. Versus if you take Jones Day away from Donald Trump, does he even win the nomination? Yes. That's the thing. Like, they've certainly helped him do a bunch of stuff, but like, no, he was still going to win. I think your your MVP analysis proves my point. I think he was still going to win. He would have hired other lawyers. He would have hired Paul Clement to do stuff for him. Who knows? But Cravath, no one in this industry moves without Cravath giving them permission. That's how bonuses work in, I believe, nine out of the last 11 years. Cravath does something first. Everyone else follows salary increases they were going to do it i understand that there was a the previous salary increase wasn't really driven by them but it was driven uh, by simpson yes that is the one instance where that didn't happen uh before that any salary increases were either driven by tech firms or cravath and i just think that you you've got to give it to cravath for changing the game that, that's what they did here they changed the game you know what i'm gonna agree with you just because of this right okay good just because of as you just put it if Jones Day hadn't done what they did, some other firm would have stepped up to them, yeah. up, stepped up to the plate, right? And so by denying Jones Day this prestigious award, what I'm basically saying is Jones Day is no better than Bendini, Lambert, and Locke in the book The Firm, right? Yeah, I almost named this category after that firm, but good job. <laughs> Right? Because, like, if the mobsters can't launder their money through Bendini, Lambert, and Locke, they're going to find some other law firm to do it. And Mitch McDear says, well, that's your problem, FBI. I got mine. Jones yeah. Day, you're just the Bendini, Lambert, and Locke of the Trump administration. And if you weren't around, Trump would fire somebody else to carry the water for him. So, all right, Cravath, good job. Yeah, I, I'm glad that this worked out, because had you not come around, I was going to have to pull a Kanye and say, I've let you finish, but Cravath had the best <laughs> year of any law firm. So that's it for our categories this year. Now, in future years, maybe we'll think of some other categories. Maybe we'll have a more formalized process. Maybe we'll hire Ernst & Young to actually watch our balloting. Who knows? But this is an experiment, but I thought this went well. Can I get out of the tux now? Um, absolutely. I Do you go cummerbund or no cummerbund? You know, it's interesting. I actually don't mind the cummerbund. I tend to go no cummerbund, but I, I don't mind when I do. I went cummerbund when I was thinner. Now it's just, uh, now it's like a lap band. So I don't, yeah. <laughs> I can't rock that anymore. So your vest <laughs> all the way now? <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah, interesting. Yeah, I, I've gone both ways. You know, cummerbund is classic. All right, so... I think we've uh, we've prattled on long enough. Thanks, everyone, for listening throughout the year. Uh, if you haven't been listening throughout the year, you should. You can go on to any of the various places where podcasts live and listen to the archives. And then you can subscribe so you hear all the future ones. And we'll find out what 2017 has in store for the legal world of joking around. Can't be worse. Yeah, right. So you got to... Give us reviews, uh, subscribe to the Legal Talk Network app, and listen to all the other offerings of the Legal Talk Network. All those good things. Read above the law. We're there. You know, follow us on Twitter, etc. That's it. Thanks, everybody. Have a nice new year. Yeah, I'm, I'm rushing through this because we just got word that we've gone long into the evening news and we've got to get out. There, so, bye, everybody. If you'd like more information about what you've heard today, please visit LegalTalkNetwork.com.
You can also find us at AboveTheLaw.com, ATLRedline.com, iTunes, RSS, Twitter, and Facebook. The views expressed by the participants of this program are their own and do not represent the views of, nor are they endorsed by, Legal Talk Network, its officers, directors, employees, agents, representatives, shareholders, and subsidiaries. None of the content should be considered legal advice. As always, consult a lawyer.